before I get into the material, but I know you, know, you need to be involved, right? Engagement was a pretty big word. So why don't we do something where you're engaged to kind of get your mind maybe going a different way, and then I'll introduce myself, okay? Because I think you've been listening, kind of being a little bit passive, right? For the last 15, 20 minutes, which is, that's natural, but it's time to get you involved. So, and I appreciate that, thank you very much, and I'm gonna get into some other things. So, um, you should have a guide, right? On your, right in front of you, right? It says, engaging te teaching strategies and managing behavior without really trying. If you just go ahead and go over to page two, there's gonna be some room for you to write down an answer. So, I'll go ahead and pull this up here. We're going to watch a quick video. First we'll watch a commercial. Real quick. What's this guy's name again? All right. What's the other guy? All right, that I know. All right. Make this louder for a second. The Republican controlled House of Representatives, in effort to alleviate the effect of the anyone, anyone? The Great Depression passed the anyone? Anyone? The tariff bill, the Holly Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered? Raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? The Laffer curve. Anyone know what this says? It says that at this point on the revenue curve, you will get exactly the same amount of revenue as at this point. This is very controversial. Does anyone know what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? Anyone? Something D-O-O -O economics. Voodoo economics. Great. So here's what we're going to do here. You're going to take down, we're going to write down some ideas on that sheet of paper right in front of you. What would you do differently to engage students? Write down at least three things you would do. I'm gonna pull up a Word file. We're gonna create our own little Word file here. So, I'll come. let's talk about process and product, right? So, and then I'll tell you a little bit about my background while our, another special guest comes on up here and types in her answer. I've got a group of what, Falana, 80 people in here? Yes. Right? Now most of us don't have classes that are 80 students, thank God. Um, my classes typically run, the most I'll have is 29, 28. Um, sometimes uh, they might, there might be 10, 12. We all, you know, my administrators would love to have them all full, right? Of course. So, when you've got a group of 30 people and you ask an open-ended question like, hey, what do you teach? Diesel engines. Tell me how uh, a turbine engine works. Or tell me the difference between, a, is there a difference between how a diesel engine works and a turbine engine? And they work the same. They work differently. So let's say I've got a group of students you probably have a small class, maybe more like 20. No, 30? Down lower, right, 12. All right, guys, tell me how, what's the difference between a diesel engine and a, and, a, and a turbine engine. How many people of those 15 students will answer? Two? Maybe. Zero? One? And if it's 8 o'clock in the morning, negative? If you can go to negative? Um, that's, that's not a strategy to get people involved. That's just human nature. 
Because if I have 80 people in here as I do right now, and I posted that video up here, we watched it, and I said, hey, you know, how would you teach that differently? Maybe five of you would answer. Maybe one of you in the back, right? And then maybe a couple people up here. But that's just the way we are. That's, that's the way we're wired for the most part, um, depending on who you are, of course, too. So you've got to develop a way to get people involved. And so this is a really simple strategy, and it's called brainstorming. Write that down. Brainstorming. Get away from asking students open-ended questions that you know you're not going to get all of them to answer. When you force them, require them to write down their answers, and then you act as a facilitator and you walk around and make sure that they're on task like I did, then now you have 12 out of 12 answering. Sometimes you'll have 10 out of 12, right? People, maybe someone didn't bring in a pen, or someone just doesn't feel like answering or thinking, and then you quietly prod that student. Hey, just get me one thing. I, I know I asked for three. See if you can come up with one idea. And this is what we have. So that's process, and then this is product. Now you've got answers up here. So whereas I may have had three to five people answering in a group of 80, now I've got all of you answering, and I've got these to review with you. And they're up here for a reason. Another good thing about brainstorming is you're able to control the flow of information. Because if you've been doing this long enough, you'll know that sometimes students will come up with some crazy ideas that you might not want to go down that rabbit hole. So now you've got non-rabbit hole ideas, right? And then that person who's like, you know, thinking a little bit differently can maybe, you know, go over something after class or during class at a certain time. But this is what we have here, and I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so you can see what your colleagues have written. If you can't see it in the back, I'll even bold type it, and I'll make it, is that better? Like this? Great. So let's go over the things that really don't get students engaged. Now what you have up here is great, but your tone of voice has nothing to do with their engagement. Now you might say, nah, I don't know about that because if your tone of voice, if you're monotone, you're going to put them to sleep, right? But that doesn't mean that they're engaged in working at something. That just means that you've got their attention more. It's a little bit different. Body movement, same thing, right? Me dancing around and, and talking in a different tone of voice doesn't get you engaged. It might create a little bit more interest, but you're not working with the material. Calling on a specific student is a tried and true measure, right? But if you call on one student out of 15 or out of 30, the other 29 are hanging out. Implement stories. Now, two ways of looking at this. To truly engage students, whose stories need to be implemented? Their stories. So if you say, okay, I want you to tell me a story. In this case, we're talking about you know, uh, the depression. And as we get further and further away from the depression, unfortunately, um, our students don't have relatives that they know that went through it. Most of us probably do. And I'm not making any comment about age in here. But I mean, if, if I were asked by a teacher you know, back in 1988, Tell me uh, if you have any relatives. Write down the names of relatives who were affected by the, by the Depression, who were, who were alive in the 19, uh, late 20s, early 30s. I'd be able to do that. So getting them to tell stories is going to be engaging. I like this one. Find a creative way to engage a student. OK, well, what is that way? What is the way? And as we move down here, you'll see Kahoot. You'll see Kahoot, something called turning tech. Ma'am, what's turning tech? We have clickers that we use with turning technology, and basically we, it's, we build kind of like a PowerPoint game, and you can put anything you want into it, and they have to, it's like using the hoops, but it's with the overhead. Respond. Right. They have clickers they respond with? Okay, now that's a cost. I could share you with you something later. I didn't have my lesson plan. I'm going to get to that. Since you guys mentioned lesson plan, I'm going to show you my lesson plan for today. So that's specific. What Falana did is a specific activity. Do you have a name for that? What do you call it? Zoom activity. Mm -hmm. Think, Group. Pair, share. Think, pair, share? Yes. 
That's a modified think pair share. I'm going to show you a different way to do think, think pair share. What Falana did was hand out the sticky notes. She had you go to a group leader. Now, the way it worked in here is it's difficult to see how that would work in class because there's it's a ton of people and it's a small group. But I'll tell you what, what she's done, what she did with you to start today, easily works in a class of 20, 25 students. You can manage it really, really easily. Think about that. That's a specific strategy. Modified think pair share. Okay, so we'll get to this to my lesson plan in a second. Let me pull out my phone here because I took some notes as you guys were writing down. Um, you came up with your ideas. This is what you guys wrote down. I heard a lot of, of these words. Engagement. You want to learn about technology. Someone mentioned millennials. You're a little bit off there. You know why? What? Millennials are 30. Millennials are now in their 30s, and now we've got Generation Z. Generation Z, the oldest Generation Z is about 24 years old, which means now you've got Generation Z and Millennials. And, and if you look, if you ever want to just take a look at what some research says, go to the Pew Research Center, PEW, and, and just look up Generation Z. There are some subtle differences. One of the major ones, though, is we think of millennials as addicted to their cell phones, right? Millennials, millennials, you hear people complain about millennials being the, uh, the trophy, entitlements, that sort of thing, you know, never really. There's a lot that's good about them, too. But Generation Z truly grew up with these devices. So. We'll talk about that a little bit. Practical, you want, and then Falana mentioned metacognition, which is basically thinking about thinking. They need to be aware of how they're learning. And then I heard assessment strategies later on and lesson planning. But what's interesting, I have a question for you, and then I'll talk a little bit myself. What does it mean to teach? Now think about this for a second. I was uh, just up in Baltimore on Monday. I was at a trade school. Okay, this is a school that um, the enrollment's about 500 students. They teach HVAC, uh, auto, um, electric, like ES, ES, EST, electric systems, technology, and I can't remember the other one. So there was a new instructor there, and he was probably in his late 50s, had never taught before, and um, he looked frightened, okay? And we were, you know, I, and he, he was learning how to teach on the job as uh, Dr. Mackey. Uh, had mentioned before, right? Sometimes people are, are hired and they put right in a fire. And I wonder, I just wondered to myself, what does he think teaching is? For those of you who are relatively new in the last year, what do you think teaching is? You can answer. <laughs> Notice my theory is proven. When you ask an open-ended question, go ahead. It's getting information from Right. And so we call those learning outcomes, right? We, so, we're, we, so you just define teaching as providing information to students that need to know that information to then go get a job. Good. Purveyors of information. Give me something else you're thinking about. What's teaching? Uh, I've told a, a number of my friends and colleagues that, that I view as my being a teacher as a translator. Okay, anybody can read the book, and I insist they read the book. Books as one thing, but having been in the workplace, they need a translator to, to translate what the theory is and how it actually works in the real world. What do you teach? Aviation maintenance technology. Okay. So translating what is theory into the practical. Good. What else? Go ahead, man. We'll have one more. What's that? Facilitation knowledge, and that's, I want to use that word, facilitation. So you all have to see yourselves as facilitators. You are not <coughs> filling up, you're not like this picture right here, you know, if it was full. Teaching is not a full picture. You're not a full picture and you're pouring into the, into the glass. The student's not an empty glass you're, you're filling. Learning and teaching, they have to go hand in hand 
and people need to be uh, required and expected to meet you halfway. Like you gotta give them ways that they can be, participate in the process. That's what we're here for. There's a whole bunch of other stuff too. Yes? I'd like to make a general comment on what you just said. If you watch the video, you have some students that are staring at the instructor intently. You have some students laying their head on the table. As an instructor, you have to, to figure out what motivates that student. And, and it may not be, you can't just do a blanket way of instructing. You have to figure out, okay, these people, they need this kind of instruction. These people need a little more attention. And, and one thing that I found, once you get the ones that really care involved, the thing is, though, is if you've got a class of you know, 25 students, you might not be able to really understand how each individual per person learns. What we're going to do is we're going to get into some theory in a little bit, um, but we're not going to make it boring, right? There, there, I like what's called multiple intelligence theory, which we're going to get into that in just a second. And that way, if you develop enough strategies where you can engage students of all different types of all those different types of learners you're going to be okay all right now um, let's I'll, I'll give you a little intro about myself so I, I've worked with the Mississippi Community College Board for a few years now I come here and, and we work ITL together um, and and I've been in the community college uh, let's call it an industry right since uh, 95 so I started uh, teaching as an adjunct English uh, and I'm, I live in Charleston, South Carolina. At the community college there, we call our community colleges technical colleges. And, uh, and then after being there for a couple of years, and before that I worked at a university, a couple of universities, and then I ended up making my way into the community college system. Took a job at what's called Ori Georgetown Technical College. Has anybody ever heard that before? Or, yeah? I heard someone say, woo. Who? Who? Who's? No? Did I just imagine that? <laughs> Has anybody ever been to Myrtle Beach? Raise your hands, Myrtle Beach. Then that means you've seen the college where I work at. Somehow you passed it and didn't even know. Um, and so it's, it's in Myrtle Beach. And I've been there since 97. I started teaching English there. By 2003, I kind of moved into a faculty development role. And I work with, uh, with new full-time faculty. Dr. Mack, you mentioned before you have about 80, I think 83. Right, is that the number you said? We've got 17 new faculty members coming on in August. That's at one college, 17. We are starting new programs. We're starting a, a new CNC program at my campus. We're starting a Megatronics program at my campus. We've got, uh, my, my small campus is, is, is booming right now. Um, we've got Marine Diesel coming aboard. And then, of course, we've got the uh, transition. Uh, we've got people moving in, moving out, and new people coming in. Uh, so my job is to work with that new faculty cohort for the first semester, and then I'll get a new faculty cohort in January. So I've been doing that for years. Love that part of my job. I still do teach. I teach uh, communications a couple classes a semester, and I also do a freshman orientation course every now and then as well. So um, I work with other colleges. Like, you know, for instance, uh, in the summer, I'm not full time. So I, I can move on to other schools and work with other schools. Uh, and I've been doing that for about 15 to 18 years. And uh, I've been at some of your schools. I've been um, to uh, Holmes, um, Itawamba, and I think one, Coahoma is another one I've been to as well. So I do, I do love coming to Mississippi. I always um, enjoy being here. So that's that. My finger, you might have a question on my finger. That's a disgusting story if you want to hear about that. <laughs> at lunch, right before lunch is a good time to talk about that. So uh, let's move on from here. I got another clip for you, and we're going to do something a little bit different. Go ahead and log in. Using the same page, we'll go here, and we'll go off of that and go here. Remember Mr. Holland's Opus? It's an old movie. I want you to watch this clip. Don't do anything yet. Lights.
Is that better? That's my favorite part. Good. I did my job. So, here's your responsibility. All right. Uh, now, I just. With the person next to you, I want you to don't talk yet. You have to do this first. You have to write down what you would do specifically to engage the student. So, the student is actually doing something. What would you have a student do in response to that question? Write down what you would do. Then with the person next to you, tell that partner what you would do. Then the partner would tell you what he or she would do. And then when you're done, we'll resume. I will give you about two minutes. First, write down what you would do. Then share that with your partner next to you. All right, so what we'll do here is we'll, we'll do process and product. Well, first we'll do product. I just want three answers, right? Three answers. Anybody in the back, like, ha back half, back third, think they come up with something that, that seems they want to share with other people? You have all the chance to share in your small group. Anybody that thinks that they've got something that we haven't discussed yet? We've talked about brainstorming, right? You mentioned Kahoot. Anybody mentioned something different? Candy? So is candy a name or is candy the candy? All right. So you're saying throw candy at your students? I average 20 students in my classroom. I normally pick up about five small pieces of candy when I first five Good. Great. If you th and that works. They're typically pretty. All right. Maybe pick up some hamburgers. Bean bags? I have little bags. Do you then allow that student to turn and throw it to someone else? Yes. That's called, you can do that toss a question or toss an answer. Look this stuff up. Toss a question is actually something that I've read about in a book 25, 30 years ago. A guy named Spencer Kagan, K-A-G-A-N, is like the godfather of cooperative learning. Toss a question and this is in his book's been around. Good, so that's two already. One more. Go ahead. Ask an open, a break class in the group question like what is music or what is music to you, what are your favorite music and have an answer. Good. Small group discussion, right, separating, separating to groups of three or four, maybe two, that's going to work too. Take the pressure off of yourselves when you're lecturing. The lecture is not about you and providing the information. The lecture is about you and the students working together. Now, we all know that they're not going to know everything, but trying to get them interested in it by getting them to make it personal would be great. So let's have one from up here. Yes, sir? I'd play a song and discuss what music was. Then I'd sing to them. 
At that point, the enrollment may go down. <laughs> there might be some drops. If it's the first day, hopefully they get another class, right, to take over that class. But yeah, you know, getting them also to sing or getting them to, to somehow like play a beat or something. All these things, you know, are, that you mentioned are great, right, because they get them engaged. So what we've done is this think, pair, share, which Falana did in, in a different way, right? She had you guys think and then get up and share with, your, with a leader and then report back to the class. It's the same thing. But think, pair, share has been around for a long time. Do you want to add something? You want to say anything? Oh, no. Okay, all right, all right. Just, all right. So, you know, these, these, this is what we need to be starting to do. Now, let me share with you. You know, you guys <laughs> mentioned before about um, the lesson planning, right? And you, some of you said, oh, I'd like to learn a little bit more about lesson planning. Uh, let me tell you a secret. Um, most college instructors, post-secondary instructors, they don't do lesson plans. Lesson planning, for the most part, is a K-12, let's just, I don't want to call it a phenomenon, but I mean, it is. I do lesson plan, even though I really never taught full-time in a K-12 setting. I did a master's program in special education. I did my student teaching. But like, here's my lesson plan for today. And so what you see here and this is, I want to bring this up in regards to when Dr. Mackey was up here and Falana was up here. So I've got, here's my activity. We did this, right? Play two clips, Ferris Bueller, Mr. Holland's Opus. We're going to get into this activity in a second. And it's going a little bit beyond my time. That's okay. But I've got how many minutes I want to spend on each one. This right here, C, says review of MI theory. That's lecture. That's some lecture here. Activity, activity. Activity. So this is mostly activities. I do have other lesson plans where there is room for 15 minutes, 20 minutes of lecture. And it'll say lecture, PowerPoint. I'll bring up one of those for you so you just can see what that might look like. So this one was de de um, delivered to Mississippi Community College Board Leadership Cohort. And you can see here or if you can't see, I'll just tell you. Here's an anecdote and a brainstorm question to get the group involved. That's, that's 15 minutes. Jot down three things you know about morale, what affects morale at your college, 15 minutes. That's also an activity. But then I get into the slides. This is lecture. So there's room for both lecture and activities. And so what I meant before when, when I said to you, okay, you know what, let's do an activity to start with today instead of me introducing myself. Well, that's because when Falana was up here, she did a combination of activity and lecture. Then Dr. Mackey was up here, and he spoke for about 15, 20 minutes. And so I knew, as a facilitator, if I get up here and speak for another 10 minutes, human beings just want to be involved a little bit more, right? Some of you are introverted, some of you are extroverted. Even if you're introverted, even if you prefer not to be engaging with other people. I got to do something where you can do it on your, turn, on your terms. So let's do something else here. You see how that works? So, so you know, you will, as, as I think Falana mentioned, you will go over some lesson planning um, strategies at some point during your, your ITL, which is full year. So let's go, um, let's go to your, your guide, okay? On page two, there begins an MI survey. MI survey, multiple intelligence survey. What I'd like you to do is take about 15 minutes to complete the survey. It's on pages two, three, and four. There are seven multiple intelligences. If you flip it over like this, yeah, right? So you're gonna grade yourselves. Each statement gets a one, a two, or a three. The first statement for body kinesthetic is, someone read it. Okay, so this guy right here, you look like you, you might work out, right? Yeah. Do, you, do you go to the gym or run? Or, neither? You just, okay. Do you? How often do you go a week? Twice a week, so that's probably a two, right? 
for those of you who go like every day or do something five, and then you put down a three. For those of you who don't really do anything physical, then you'd put down a one. So each, each one, you don't skip these, right? Each statement gets a number one, two, or three. Three means that's you to a, to, to a T. Two means, you know, maybe sometimes, right? One is never, all right? Fill out each of these and then score each one. You'll have three, you'll have seven scores, right? One for each of these intelligences. The scores will range between 10 and 30. There's no right or wrong answers, okay? Take some time and get that done. So, I asked three people. <laughs> By the time I got to the third person, each of the multiple intelligences were represented. That's probably a record for how, how quickly that was. Completely random. I didn't know what their scores were. Sometimes I have to get to like seven or eight. Usually by the time I get there, all of them are represented. What does that mean? So you've got like four. 418 and 120. Yeah, that means you probably learn you don't have one way, you don't have two ways, you've got like a lot of ways. You've got four or five different ways you like to engage with material. None of us learn one way. None of us learn one way. Here's the thing. So um, Jeffrey just asked, you know, what does it mean if I've got five scores that are like, you know, high and then a couple that are low? Um, one of the things I, I hate hearing from both educators and from students is, oh yeah, you know, uh, my students are visual learners and auditory learners, right? Or, or for a student to say, I'm a visual learner. Now that's, that's fine, but you're also other types as well. You don't just learn one way. Um, and, and educators need to be aware of that too. Out of curiosity, who in here has ever heard of multiple intelligence theory? So maybe 10% of you, and the rest of you have not. That's okay. But as educators, you need to know just a rudimentary outline of what it is, right? I learned about it when I was in grad school for special education. You know, it was a class on, on learning styles, multiple intelligence theory, and you, know, you have to know about that when you're teaching special ed because those students are not going to learn um, in, in a traditional way. They, they, you have to teach to how they learn. Whereas the rest of us, when you're in a general education setting, you can, you don't, it's a little bit different. But we still need to teach the, the variety of learning styles in our classroom. This is multiple intelligence theory. As I said, it took me three people to get to where it's all represented. The reason I had you circle three high scores were because you don't just learn one way. So in regards to what you have, body kinesthetic, Okay, let's think about this. Um, Falana in here started out with something that allowed you to engage with a concept in a kinesthetic way by movement. When she had you all get up and talk to one another in groups. When I had you guys, some of you come up here and type out what your answers were for that first brainstorm question, that's kinesthetic. There's a reason why in my classroom my students are up out of their seats at least once in an hour and 20 minute class. Because I know that some of those folks, they need to get up. They need to move around. So um, for those of you who, who, who scored high in that, you probably, when you're working out, when you're running, when you're outside doing yard work, what's going on in your mind? Who scored high in body kinesthetic? Okay. Sir, what's going, what, why do you, do you do things that are relatively routinely physical? What, what would that be? You garden. And how do you feel? What's going on in your mind when you're gardening? All kinds of stuff goes through his mind. He's thinking. That's what it is. So I score high on that as well. And the example I've given out for years is when my brother got married and I had to give the best man speech. I went for a long run. And I basically developed the speech on that run. And by the time I got home, 
Didn't need note cards, didn't need to write it down. It was all here, because I went for like a two hour run, the day of the wedding, boom. You see how that works, right? So that's, you gotta get your students involved. Two, I mentioned the two verbs, engage and activate. We faculty members are responsible for activating each of these intelligences in our classroom. So the students can then engage with new concepts. Just think of it that way. We're responsible for activating so that they may engage. I'll give you an example, and I didn't pull this up before. You all can see my screen, right? So I like, this is an article that came out in 2015 in the Washington Post. For some reason, they came down to where I live. This school, this school, you can see this first picture here. My kids used to go to school here. Um, and you can see this, it's called Active Brains. Not every school has something like this, but there are a lot out there that do. Yoga mats, and they're doing math. These guys are on um, ellipticals looking at real, the, at the math cards, you know those, what do they call those? The flash cards for addition, right? Um, and so that's a picture. I'm just going to show you some pictures here, okay? I'm not going to go over the article. There's a bunch of pictures. This guy's on a BOSU ball, balancing, okay? Whatever these are called. Right? And this is a class where the teacher is, been, has been trained how to get the students onto these different little contraptions. Right here, here's, um, you can see that picture here, bean, bean bag toss. That's why the, 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 the lady who mentioned, that, that's, that right there is kinesthetic. That right there is kinesthetic. They're still in their seats, but they're moving. And just so you can see a couple more pictures. Stationary bike. Using, you know, manipulatives. These, anybody ever see this in a K-12 classroom? Any, anything like that set up? Yeah, it's on the news down here about one of the schools. Here. Yeah. The, for what? Autism. For autism? Mm -hmm. Okay. And it works for kids who don't have autism. I mean, we have. So here's my message to you: Get your students out of their seats, at least once. Go back to this, your your survey, interpersonal. <coughs> What did Falana and I do? Did you all talk to one another? You've already done it three times. Once when Falana was up here and twice with me. That is because I know I've got people in this room that need to talk to other people to engage. The other one is intrapersonal. It's, it's not mutually exclusive, right? You're not one or the other. I'm both. When did I give you time for that? I gave you time for that for intrapersonal when you worked alone, when? Filling out the survey and writing down your, your ideas. Now I could have, I, that's also verbal, right? Because writing is verbal, so I knocked that out of the way. Because some of you are verbal, so I got you to write. I could also ask you to write a paragraph. Some of you might really want to do that, so I'll, I'll give you that option. And then the, the intrapersonal, the people that want to reflect, Give your students a chance to just reflect at least once in your class meeting. So we've got body kinesthetic, interpersonal, intrapersonal. Then we get to logical, which is in your survey, giving them a chance in class to solve a problem. Right? If you teach math, that's pretty easy. You've got um, visual spatial. Now let me think about this for a second. Take a chance here. Uh, I'm going to go back to old school, which is just the random question, have you guys just shout out the answer. Because you still do that. In regards to activating the visual intelligence in your students, what does that mean in terms of what your responsibility is? It's different. It's the opposite. It's, what do they need to do? 
hands-on doing what? Visual. Give me what? Drawing. Putting things together. So if the, so, you don't have to like. Oh, I have visual learners. I have to show videos. Oh, I have visual learners. I have to show them a graph. No, they need to create a video. You will have students that will. They would love to just create a video. And there's software out there that's free. There are websites. There are apps out there where they can create their own screencast to explain a concept. They'll love that because they're visual. They they have to draw. You don't show them. They show you. Okay, well, and I think you should be excited about this because it's like, oh my God, I've thought about teaching that I'm the purveyor of information. All this responsibility is on me. No, it's not. It's half and half. Give them the opportunity and, let, and make them, require them to do it. Then you have verbal, which is, we went over that already. And finally, we've got musical. And I'm going to go to Hannah Montana to show you what that looks like. I know, well, unfortunately, my kids were like born after her. This is really cool, though. You know what I should do first? Unmute my, um, there we go. I'll unmute it. And here we go. I'm a cool man, we call him Mr. Humorous, and that's no fit. I take that home with a variety of bone. It might be crazy, but I learned that way. Jim Crow and Puzzle, too. And now I'm finding through. That makes you 106. I found a way to flex. When I milk the cat on a little farm, I use the only bone that is in my arm. Booyah! Everybody knows the bones just had to find a way. Okay, you get the drift, right? What were the uh, the lyrics that stand out that relate exactly to how she learns? Remember, that makes two hundred to six. What's the next, the next line? I've seen this a lot of times. <laughs> I found a way that clicks. That's how I'll get an A. I just had to find a way that's how I'll get an A. There's another one in there as well. That's how I learned that way, right? <laughs> so, you know, believe it or not, like you don't have to sing your, for musical rhythmic intelligence, you don't have to sing. You, you, you don't have to sing. <laughs> Let them do it. You know, give them, a popular song for them to kind of like put something to. Now, I don't do this that often, admittedly. I don't teach a he a, uh, classes that are heavy in terminology, but like you get into A&P and nursing, you get into classes where there's a lot of terminology, that is going to work. I've heard it and I've seen it in my own college. I've had other people in groups like this, like, oh, we do this. Do you do that? Any Try to keep it clean, try, or try to give them, like, make it clean, give the clean version. But it works. Give them the opportunity. Now, I haven't really talked about multiple intelligence theory. We just kind of go over the, the different ones, which is really all you need to know. But just to give you the background, um, there's a really good website here. It's just, it's very simple. Instituteforlearning.com, institute, the number four, learning.com. And there's a section um, devoted to this multiple intelligence theory. Now. Thomas Armstrong is the guy that has this down here, but it was developed by a guy named Gardner, right? He was an education professor at Harvard back in like the 80s, I think it was 83, and he came up with seven. I'm just giving you a little background here. Seven multiple intelligences, or eight multiple intelligences, I'm sorry. Um, the other one we didn't go over is naturalistic, and I, it's not like I don't think it's important, but, you know, that's essentially learning. If you ever hear of ropes courses, like a lot of leadership courses will be involved outside. Um, we've got things like uh, Outward Bound, uh, something called National Outdoor Leadership School. Sometimes kids, uh, actually a kid I know, um, had some behavioral issues, so he ended up going to school in a very different setting out basically in the woods for two months. Um, and then, you know, th those sorts of things. Later on in the 90s, a ninth 
intelligence was introduced. It's called moral or existential. That's basically engaging with concepts in terms of their moral uh, qualities, uh, justice, that sort of thing. Well, really, you can, you know, if you teach nursing, you can imagine how that would go with like euthanasia or you know, opioids, you know, that sort of thing. Um, all of us could, could definitely have students engage in that as well. It's just not in this and it's not in my survey. So you can get students thinking in terms of that. Some of them will really, really want to engage with your new concepts in that way. So how many questions? Did that on purpose. Why did I do that on purpose? Yeah, you're on the right track. What happens when you ask to prove my theory? And here's my theory. What would the theory be about questions? Getting students to ask questions. What's, what's my theory? Yep. So when you say to your students, if, you, if you've been doing this for any length of time, and you say, does anybody have any questions? No one has any questions. Now, this is a little bit different because you know there's not a test on this. I'm not going to, well, maybe I will today end, this, end of the test. But the truth of the matter is your students have questions, but they're just, and they're not too lazy to ask them. They're just automatically passive. Most of your students, they just want to be bathed in this enlightenment, right? You tell me what I need to know for the test. I may or may not take notes. Does anybody have any questions? Of course not. What do we do to get people to ask questions? We'll get to that at the end. 